बिसमीम रबिश लाहली सदरी व यसरली अमरी वाहरुलदतमिलसानी यफका कौली माई लॉर्ड एक्सपेंड फॉर मी माई ब्रेस्ट विद एश्योरेंस एंड ईज फॉर मी माई टास्क एंड अन टाई द नॉट फ्राम माई टंग दैट दे मे अंडरस्टैंड माई स्पीच आमीन डियर स्टूडेंट today we are going to learn about uh, problems and problem solving so let's begin with a definition of the problem a problem occurs when there is an obstacle between a present state and a goal and it is not immediately obvious that how to get around the obstacle obstacles to reach that goal there might be two types of problems first one is well defined problem it usually have a correct answer it has certain procedures that when applied correctly will lead to a solution in simple word if the initial state the acceptable operations and the goals are very clear and you can reach a single unique solution this problem is known as well defined problem and the examples of well defined problems are mathematical problems games and puzzles whereas ill defined problems are related to our everyday life problems that occur frequently and do not necessarily have one correct answer the starting position and operations to solve the problem and the goals nothing is clear for example relationship problems and other career related issues okay now we will see the popular example of well defined problem a well known example of well defined problem is crossword puzzle and you have solved it so many times i think so you see the instructions and goals and they are very clear and you are supposed to fill the white squares with letters to form words or phrases with with the help of the given clues Uh, that lead to uh, the answers <clears throat> now there may be different ways to present crossword puzzles similarly people may have different ways to represent the problems presented in the crossword puzzles in their own minds for example some people like to focus on small parts of the puzzle whereas others choose to focus on different connected parts of the puzzle some people may try to go for the horizontal lines to fill in the blanks but others may to choose to solve the vertical lines so people have different representations of the puzzle in their own mind and according to gestalt perspective on problem solving we solve problems with the representations of the problems that we have in our own on mind let's begin with an example see this problem uh let's represent this problem in our mind you can see a circle divided in four quadrants with horizontal and vertical lines in upper left coordinate you also see a triangle where the problem is presented that is to find the length of the line x that is actually the part of the triangle now all of you know what is radius of a circle and in this picture you can see uh, i have pointed it out with the red lines uh, with the range of red lines that this is the radius of the circle a line starting from the center of the circle reaching to this boundary is the radius of the circle now if we present the triangle as part of a rectangle as you see the red lines we can solve the problem so now what i am doing i am representing the problem in my own mind and seeing the rectangle over there that was not apparently visible you you can just recall the gestalt uh, principles uh, in your mind and you will find it out now the x is the diagonal of the rectangle if you see in this rectangle x is a diagonal of the rectangle and we know that both the diagonals of a rectangle they have same length 
So let's draw the other diagonal. So in this picture, on the right side, I have drawn the other diagonal of the rectangle in red dotted lines. Well, so x is equal to the red line that is the other diagonal of the rectangle because x is also a diagonal of the same rectangle. However, this red line also represents the radius of the circle that is r because it begins from the center of the circle and reaches the boundary of the circle. So this red line is also equal to r. So you can say that x is equal to r. It means the length of the x is the same as the radius of the circle. Now you see, we did not use mathematical equations. It is just the representation of the problem that helped us to solve this well-defined problem. The way we change the representation to solve the problem is called restructuring by the Gestalt psychologist. Gestalt psychologist also see restructuring linked with an insight. Insight is a sudden solution. In this case, a sudden change of representation is an insight. Insight helped us so to see the rectangle over there. In your textbook, you will find a couple of more examples about the insight that helps you to solve the problems. So hope now you can understand the concept of restructuring uh, with this example. Let's see some other problems that don't need any insight. These algebraic expressions you have solved many times uh, during your earlier studies. But these expression or these problems presented over here does not require an insight. Instead, they require a calculation. You have to use the formulas. So now this well-defined problem does not require insight. So there might be two types of well-defined problems. First, that require an insight, not the calculations. And second, where calculations actually solve the problems. I hope now you understand what I mean. So what are the obstacles to problem solving? Uh, while doing problem solving, we face obstacles. Fixation is one of the obstacles that we face very often while solving problems. According to Gestalt psychologist, fixation is people's tendency to focus on a specific characteristic of the problem that keeps them from arriving at a solution. One type of this fixation that can work against solving a problem is focusing on familiar use of an object. So let's see one type of fixation that is called functional fix fixedness and functional fixedness is to restrict the use of an object to its familiar function. When we assume that this object is used for uh, this purpose, then it limits our innovative understanding about it. So we will move to the candle problem. The candle problem was first described by Carl Dunker in 1945 and he illustrates how functional fixedness can hinder problem solving. Participants in this experiment were in a room where a cork board was fixed on the wall and the material given was some candles, matchsticks in a matchbox and some nails to attach things on the board. When Dunker did this experiment, he presented one group of participants with small cardboard boxes containing materials such as candles, uh, nails and matchsticks. And the other group was presented with the same material, but they were not in the boxes. So boxes were empty. So they were provided with the boxes, but the boxes were empty. The task was to <clears throat> mount the candle on the cock board in a way that it will burn without dripping wax on the floor. So just think about it that you are supposed to 
attach the candles on the cardboard in a way that it burns but its wax should not fall or drop on the floor. Let's see what happened. Here the familiar use of the matchbox is just a container that contains the matchsticks. The familiarity will cause a hindrance and you will not use the matchbox as a sport to place candle on it. The solution to the problem occurs when the person realizes that the matchbox can be used as a sport rather than as a container. So the person will use matchboxes to place the candle on it so that the, the wax will not drip on the floor. Well, now let's see the results. The group of the participants who were given empty boxes, they were more successful in problem solving because their fixedness work was not working that well. And they know that this box can be used. But the other group who, who were given the boxes filled with matchsticks, they were perceiving it as a container. And it takes time for them to use the matchbox as a support for the candle. So through this candle problem, we come to the conclusion that functional fixedness can uh, cost a kind of hinder or obstacle in problem solving. Uh, now let's see the modern research on problem solving and in this, uh, in this research we will focus on Newell and Simon's approach that is information processing approach. Um, uh, Newell and Simon's approach uh, uh, in, in 1972 they saw problems in terms of an initial state and then the conditions at the beginning of the problem. So there was an initial state and there was a goal state that is considered the solution of the problem. So we will begin with the tower of Hanoi problems. For the tower of Hanoi problem, Hanoi uh, is the capital city um, of the Vietnam. Uh, for the tower of Hanoi problem, the following rules specify which actions are allowed and which are not. Discs are moved one at a time from one peg to another. A disc can be moved only when there are no discs on top of it. And third, a large disc can never be placed on top of a smaller disc. So in this problem, you can see three pegs and uh, in the initial state, you see the peg 1 uh, has all the three discs and peg 2 and 3 are empty. And your goal is to move all these three discs to the peg 3, leaving the peg 1 and 2 empty. But there is a rule and rule is that you have to move the disc one at a time and you can only move the disc if there is no disc on the top of it and the larger disc can never be placed on the top. So this is the problem and these are the rules. As you try solving the problems, you have to count the number of moves you take to get from initial stage to the goal state. Well, now a brief history of this problem. This problem is called the Tower of Hanoi problem. Legend says that there were there are monks in a monastery near Hanoi who are working on the same problem with 64 discs on the back one. It means problem is much more complex. According to the legend, the world will end when the problem will be solved by the monks. According to an estimated idea, this will take about a trillion years. So not to worry about it will take about a trillion years to accomplish the task successfully even if the monks make one move every second and every move is correct. Now let's see again this uh, uh, problem. Okay, to solve this problem, there may be several possible ways with several choices from initial state to the goal state. Newell and Simon named these possible ways and choices as intermediate state. So the problem starts with an initial state and then several intermediate states to reach the goal state. 
all these states collectively are called problem space. We do not have a picture of problem space as we can only know the intermediate states when we are trying to solve the problem. And we have to search for the problem space to complete the task successfully. Newell and Simon proposed that mean and analysis strategy will be useful. And it means to reduce the difference between the initial and goal state by creating and achieving sub goals. The table on the next slide will show you the terms that Newell and Simon used in this problem solving experiment. Well, the initial state, as you see in the picture, it is the beginning of a problem, the conditions at the beginning of a problem. And then the goal state, it is the solution to the problem. So in between these two states, you try, you have several steps that you made towards solving the problem. These steps are called intermediate states. And all these three states, they are known as problem space. All the possible states that could occur while solving the problem, they're known as problem space. Now the operators. Operators are the rules and you have to follow those rules to solve the problem. A means and analysis means that you reduce the difference between the initial and goal states and then you need sub goals. So in between these two states, you create sub goals and create intermediate states and you try to reach closer to your goal. Okay, now let's see in this, this picture. This is a, th these are the screenshots of a video in which this puzzle is, uh, this problem is solved. Uh, and you see how the discs are, being, discs are being moved. So in the first picture, you see the initial state when all the discs are on the peg A. But then the other pictures, they are actually about the intermediate states and they continue until you reach the goal state. You can find the complete video on the YouTube, uh, the link you can see here. Here I just want to give you an idea how this problem is being solved with information processing while creating sub goals, intermediate states between initial state and the goal state. This is a way to find out the problem space. Now this picture, you see a problem space providing the most efficient path from initial state to goal state, including intermediate states. So you see there are several intermediate states and some of those states are contributing in the efficient path from initial state to the goal state. You can uh, uh, read more details uh, in your textbook and then you can come up with your questions in our online class. <clears throat> okay, now we will uh, talk about an logical problem solving uh, and the Dunker's radiation problem. The technique of using the solution to a similar problem to guide solution of a new problem is called an logical problem solving. We will now try to learn this technique by a story given in your textbook, The Fortress Story. The Fortress Story, a small country was ruled from a strong fortress by a dictator. The fortress was situated in the middle of the country, surrounded by farms and villages. Many roads lead to the fortress through the countryside. A rebel general vowed to capture the fortress. The general knew that an attack by his entire army would capture the fortress. He gathered his army at the head of one of the roads, ready to launch a full-scale direct attack. However, the general then realized that the dictator had planted mines on each of the roads. The mines were set to the small bodies of men that, that could pass over them safely. Since the dictator needed to move all of his troops and workers to and from the fortress, it was difficult. Now, any large force would detonate the mines and not only would this blow up the road, 
but also the several neighboring villages. It is therefore seemed impossible to capture the fortress. However, the general devised a simple plan and he divided his army into small groups and dispatched each group to head of a different road and then when all were ready they were given they were given a signal and each group marched down to the fortress from different roads each group continued down to the road to reach the fortress and then entire army arrived at the fortress together from different directions in this way the general captured the fortress and overthrew the dictator now this story is used to uh, as an analog to solve another problem and the problem was tumor in our body this force story is analogous to the radiation problems because the dictator's fortress corresponds to the tumor in your body and the small groups of soldiers sent down different roads correspond to the low intensity rays that can be directed at the tumor well this process of analogical problem solving involves three steps number first noticing noticing is the analogous relationship between a source story and the target problem hence similarity is very crucial a number of experiments have shown that the most effective source stories are those which are very much similar to the problem target problem for example in these pictures you can see that if we uh, use the dictator's fortress as a tumor and the small groups of soldiers from different roads as low intensity rays then we can attack the tumor we can attack the fortress well so the noticing is the first analog relationship uh, between the source story and the target problem here similarity is very crucial second is mapping the correspondence between the source story and the target problem how you map different things from a story to the target problem and the third is applying the mapping to generate a parallel solution to the target problem hope you understand what is analogous uh, problem solving uh, well now the creative problem solving uh, creativity is often associated with divergent thinking and that is open ended thinking and divergent thinking means you have a large number of potential solutions but no correct answer although there some proposal might work better than others but there is no correct answer whereas divergent thinking uh, uh, sorry convergent thinking is opposite to divergent thinking in which we have uh, uh, we may have several uh, ways to solve a problem but we have one concrete and one correct solution so usually uh, the divergent uh, thinking is used to solve uh, uh, ill defined problems whereas the divergent thinking is used to solve well defined problems this part of lecture i would like you to read from the page 348 to 351 from your textbook and you will find several things that you have already learned in previous lectures especially before the mid term and all uh, your inf information and your understanding you have learned before and your knowledge you can apply in these pages and you can find it out however if you have questions we can talk about it in our online class uh well thank you very much i hope uh, now our textbook read will help you to understand the lecture comprehensively uh, but i would like all of you to watch this video and then read some text from your book and then we are in a good position to talk about it in our online class thank you very much